reading Shakespeare. So I'm going to pull some stuff up for myself that I need. Um, it's awesome to have you all here. Um, first off, I hope you guys are all safe and well and healthy wherever you are. Um, and thank you so much to, to River for having me for this uh, Shakespeare Sundays class. It's an awesome, wonderful series they're doing during Shakespeare's birth month. Um, and yeah, just thank you to all of my uh, co-hosts here uh, at Two River and to the whole theater for really doing so much to keep theater and art and curiosity alive right now. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, here we go. Okay, let's get started. This is Adapting and Directing Shakespeare. Um, I'll be talking about all three of those things and the combination of all of them together. Um, just a tiny bit about me to start. I am primarily a director, um, though I'm also a teacher. And from 2017 to 2019, I was the theater critic at New York Magazine and Vulture.com. Uh, essentially, I spend a lot of time thinking about theater, writing about it, um, and in better times, making it. Um, I've also spent a whole lot of time thinking about and writing about and adapting and staging Shakespeare. Um, if you've come to River often, you might have seen my recent production of Twelfth Night back in January and February of this year. Um, or you might have seen one of the productions I've done with the really wonderful A Little Shakespeare program at Two River, uh, including Macbeth and the Comedy of Errors. I'm allowed to say Macbeth this whole time because we're all in our houses and that's convenient for at least that one, you know. <laughs> that one thing. Um, excellent. Uh, I've also, uh, where Shakespeare is concerned, directed Richard III, As You Like It, both parts of Henry IV, The Tempest, Measure for Measure, The Winter's Tale, The Merchant of Venice, uh, and an original riff on A Midsummer Night's Dream called simply Midsummer. Um, and I would say that, have I successfully returned? Yes. Awesome. I am unfrozen. <laughs> Welcome back, Sarah. Yay. <laughs> what a great way to start. Okay, excellent. Um, all right. Uh, where, where did I freeze? Anyone? Any, uh, let's see, chat. After Midsummer, says Kelly. Awesome. Yay. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> okay, cool. Here we go. Let's hope I don't freeze again. Somebody please yell at me um, if I freeze, because there's no way for me to tell um, with none of the cameras shared. So, hooray, here we are again. Um, cool, okay, so. So, I, uh, so I, had, uh, I had told you guys a whole bunch of different Shakespeare productions that I've directed, um, and the claim I was making was that I believe that they could all be described as adaptations. Um, some have stuck more closely to the letter of Shakespeare's original text, while others ranged further away from it. But I would still say that they were all adaptations. And this is kind of where I give away the tricky secret of, of this class early on, which is that adapting and directing Shakespeare, for me, really are one and the same thing. They're sort of two sides of the same coin or two strands of the same braid, um, whatever metaphor you want to use. I always, I, I think of them as part of the same process. Um, directing, really directing any play that's not a brand new play, I think could be argued as always a process of adaptation. And even with a brand new play, there's the sense in which words on a page need to be adapted into their final form, which is not text purely, it's lights and colors and sounds and pictures, and most importantly, living, breathing bodies in space. So in a way, I think a director's art is sort of always an adaptive art. Um, but the simplest, most kind of comprehensive way I have of defining directing for myself is to say that the playwright is the author of a play text and the director is the author of a production of the author of the live stage event. Um, and I'll, I'll expand more on that later. So, uh, Jumping in at the beginning, here's the di dictionary definition of the verb to adapt. To make fit as for a new use, often by modification. Um, I also find myself right now thinking a lot about the evolutionary definition of adaptation, uh, which is the modification of an organism or its parts that makes it more fit for existence under the conditions of its environment. Um, I'm gonna read that one more time because I just think it's really interesting the modification of an organism or its parts that makes it more fit for existence under the conditions of its environment. I think it's kind of amazing because 
we're all doing that right now in such a visceral daily and sometimes painful way. And really, we're actually doing it every day, whether we're inside a global pandemic or not. Um, and I think we're also doing it every day as artists. As our environment changes, we change with it and the art we make changes too. There's a constant process of learning and unlearning and relearning. Um, and this is kind of why I say that every production of Shakespeare is an adaptation because whether or not the 400 plus year old text has been maintained in its total detail or whether it's been cut to ribbons and rearranged and some discarded and some added, whichever of those things is the case, the director is still making decisions about the why and the how of a given production. And those decisions are the response to the world that we live in, or I would say, I think that they should be. Um, a play lives on the page, but a, pr a production lives ephemerally in the moment of its cultural context. It's always in conversation with the world. Um, this can kind of lead quickly into questions of relevancy. And sometimes those can become a little bit rote and they can become a little flat. Like this is where we get things like, why Hamlet now and a tempest for our times and Julius Caesar now more than ever. Um, <laughs> That, that kind of thing, I think, you know, we can sort of sense the facile nature of it, but I think that, that those, those things are bubbles on the surface of something that is deeper and that does actually have meaning, which is that a director really does need to ask some big, meaty, and possibly hard and scary questions every time she approaches the play. play. Um, rather, I like to say, when I'm looking at a Shakespeare play, rather than why now, I like to adjust that question and say, why do I want to do this play in this moment? What's calling me to it? Um, and that question, the personalized version of that question will always lead pretty much immediately into another, which is, well, what is this play really about? And I don't mean it's plot when I say that. Um, we could tell the story of Romeo and Juliet right now, but that would be different from sort of zeroing in on, well, like, really, what do we think it's about? What is it talking about? What is it arguing over? Um, I'm talking about the sort of deepest and usually unresolved question at the center of a play, at its heart. Um, I'm going to do a side note here into a little bit of Russian theater history and pedagogy because I'm obsessed with it and I find it to be a really useful lens for this stuff. Uh, <laughs> so Ameri as American directors, we don't tend to learn a whole lot about the history of our art form, but it's incredibly rich and has this like really amazing history that goes right back to Konstantin Stanislavski. Um, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, don't worry. We're basically talking about a Russian actor and director and theater maker who was sort of the daddy of us all, at least in certain senses, <laughs> when it comes to directors and actors in the West. Um, so he's a big deal dude. Uh, and we're I'm gonna be quoting from a couple of people who are kind of in his lineage, who studied with him and, and carried on his teachings. Um, and the first of those people is a really amazing woman named Maria Knabel. Uh, Maria Knabel it, trained directly with Stanislavski and frankly is why we still have a massive amount of his work, even though he lived the last part of his life under glorified house arrest. Um, she's badass, a big deal theater practitioner and teacher and scholar in her own right. And this is what she has to say about the first part of a director's task when approaching a play. So this is Maria Knabel talking. Identifying the main problem of a play is a deep penetration of the spiritual world of the playwright, his ideas and those sobering reasons that moved his pen. And then here's another Russian scholar from later in the tradition. Her name is Maria Geneva talking a little bit more about um, the idea of sort of what a director's rights and job are. So this is, this is that. The director should be granted the right to conception but in order to have it, he has to do many preparations. First, he must become witness to what is happening in the play. So that sounds simple, but I think what I'm, what I'm arguing here is that it's, it's actually a much meatier task than, you know, than that sort of simple sentence, what's happening in the play might kind of originally lead us to believe. Um, I really like what Maria Geneva says about the director should be granted the right to conception, but he or she must do many preparations to earn it. There's something really wonderful, I think, in that, right? Because I think sometimes 
these days, uh, we can sometimes think of the idea of a concept, right? A directorial concept as a kind of dirty word, especially when it comes to classic work or work like Shakespeare. Um, you know, I feel like you you can kind of imagine, you can, you can hear a response to a play in your head, right? Where it's like, you know, I didn't like it. It, it had too much of a concept, you know? Um, but I think what that is, what we're probably responding to, if, if we have that kind of response when we go to see a production, we're probably responding to the fact that there's a directorial idea that seems to have been grafted onto the surface of the play rather than having been mined from inside it. Um, and this doesn't, I don't think, have to necessarily do with aesthetic. There can be really wild looking and feeling productions of Shakespeare out there that are actually shooting straight up from the heart of what the play is about. And there can be productions that are sort of dressed and staged exactly as we think they might have been dressed and staged when the play was written. And th those can potentially not move us because no digging is happening, because nothing is actually being asked. We're not learning anything new about what's really being said at the heart of this play. Um, for me, the quickest and most evocative way to think about sort of what I'm doing as a director when I take on a Shakespeare play also comes from the Russians. It's a phrase, it's a pair of phrases that I really love. Um, I love them because they're so dramatic. They're so Russian, but here they are. Um, the, they talk about the necessity of identifying first the author's suffering, and then out of that, developing the director's scream which just like, I love that. Like I'm doing my own like round of Zoom applause for that. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's such an intense statement of it, but I think that I, I like it partially because those words, the author's suffering and the director's scream, they, they match in scope and emotional scale, the kind of world Shakespeare presents us with. Um, and, and to just boil it down, the author's suffering, right? Like, it doesn't necessarily mean it's all a tragedy. That doesn't, you know, the word suffering sort of maybe, you know, maybe struggle is a good definition, right? It's like that is the unresolved question at the heart of the play that I was talking about earlier, the thing that the play is really about. So locating that is trickier than it seems sometimes, right? Like given a play like Macbeth, given a play like Hamlet, what is it really about? There's a lot going on in there but you have to make a decision. You have to find, you have to draw a circle around something that you think is being sort of fundamentally struggled with. Then as a director, you have to have something to say about that thing, something to scream about it even. Um, I think it's really important to note that you don't necessarily have to have an answer to the question. Um, in fact, I think that generally theater is actually pretty bad for answers. Um, I think <laughs> I think it's it's not much good uh, in in my sort of experience of it for sermons or for solutions, um, but it is really great for searching. I think it's great actually for breaking down what we think are answers into kind of new sets of questions. It's really great at um, at uh, it's great at nuance. It's great at kind of emotional complexity, and it's great at like leaving us at a place of sort of vulnerability and openness to new ideas. Um, so. Cool, some Russians. But so let's get back to the specifics of working with Shakespeare. What makes Shakespeare such an infinitely and, and never-endingly popular target for adaptation? Well, first, let's be real, public domain. Um, it's incredibly liberating as a director to be able to sort of dance and maneuver with a play the way that you can with one of Shakespeare's. Um, because even though I've been arguing, right, that every production in its way is a kind of adaptation, it's also, uh, it's also true that there are more and less aesthetically and textually radical ways to approach these plays, right? But all of these are possible when you're playing with Shakespeare. So like adapting a Shakespeare play could mean, among other things, resetting its story in another time or historical context keeping its story, but playing with its language. Um, this, an example of this might be if you're familiar with um, Oregon Shakespeare Festival's Play On project, when they brought in playwrights to kind of modulate and um, not entirely modernize, but sort of semi-modernize the language of the plays. Um, or you could kind of do the opposite, right? You could maintain the original language, but you could do some cutting, some shifting, some rearranging, 
for reasons of clarity, for reasons of performance length, uh, to highlight certain themes. Um, you could also combine or condense a longer narrative or set of stories into a kind of, um, you know, a, a, into, into something with its own new arc, right? Its own kind of condensed powerful arc. This could be something like, uh, if you're familiar with the BBC's Hollow Crown series, where they put together a whole bunch of the history plays, um, or a similar thing in, in my life and experience. Um, years ago, there was a really beautiful production done as a collaboration by the Chicago Shakespeare Theater and a British all-male company called Propeller. And the production was called Rose Rage, and it was a really kind of amazing condensation of the three Henry VI plays. Um, this is also what I did with my Henry IVs. When I, so those are two plays, and when I approached those plays, I made them into a uh, performance that could be done in a single evening. So it was still pretty long, about a little less than three hours, but it ran like uh, it ran like two halves of a single story instead of like two separate plays. Um, you could also create an entirely original riff or a new story based on Shakespeare. Uh, this is what playwrights are doing a lot right now with, if you've heard of, um, there's a theater down in Stanton, Virginia called the American Shakespeare Center. And they've got a really interesting project where they're, they're commissioning playwrights to write new, what they're calling companion plays for each of Shakespeare's plays. So these will be totally new works, but they'll each be bouncing off of a Shakespeare play. Um, you could also, as a director, riff or remix or create a kind of devised performance out of images or themes or motifs from a given Shakespeare play. Um, there's a really amazing Russian director named Dmitry Krimov, who's a, a great uh, love and influence of mine. And he's got a kind of fantastic, strange production called A Midsummer Night's Dream As You Like It, which is, which is really to say A Midsummer Night's Dream As He Likes It. It's, a, you know, it's an odd production with a, with a little live dog running around and enormous puppets that represent Pyramus and Thisbe, a lot of music, a lot of strange choreography. Is it? the text of a William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream? No, it's not. Is it in some sense A Midsummer Night's Dream? Yes, it definitely is. Um, so there's something, you know, working with Shakespeare, the fact that Shakespeare exists in the public domain for us offers you all of these opportunities and more. And it's, it's kind of, it's like, sure, they're free in the commercial sense, but they're also incredibly freeing in the much larger cultural and spiritual sense. Um, it's, I mean, there, there isn't really another, there's not quite, I don't think, another canon of theatrical literature out there that has become the whole world's birthright in the way that Shakespeare has, um, which is incredibly exciting and galvanizing. And it will also, like, <laughs> there's no way to deplete it or destroy it. Um, no single production will ever solve Hamlet. Although, you know, you might come across the production that for you is the one, but no single production will ever, really, you know, will ever be the only, the only production we ever need of that play. And likewise, no bad production will ever actually ruin it. Um, I'll never forget being in a 10th grade English class where we were reading Othello and there was a kid talking at the back of the class um, during one of the lessons and my English teacher slammed the book down on the desk and pointed at this kid in the back of the room and was like, talk all you want, but Othello will outlive you. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, and it was, it was sort of stunning. And I, as a 10th grader, I kind of thought she's right. Um, these things are bigger than us and yet like we're allowed inside their kind of huge jungle gyms, which is so exciting. So, um, so this is, I think, you know, these are some of the reasons why directors want to get our hands on this stuff. Um, and I think another reason, frankly, is that Shakespeare's plays respond well to adaptation because they, they are adaptations. Almost every single one of them is already a reworking of some older story or, or set of stories. There's so many like old legends or myths or archetypes or even just straight up historical documents, you know, kind of histories of England um, or tales from the Decameron, like whatever it is, almost all of them are, are sort of stolen, you know, or, you know, borrowed to begin with. Um, and there's something very liberating in that as well. So moving on to what is the difference then between adapting a Shakespeare play and directing it? And how does one lead into the other? Um, so in my own process, 
I think of adapting as the writerly side of directing. Uh, it's always the first step in my process when I'm approaching Shakespeare as I read the play and then reread it and then set about to start to shape the text for production. It's my chance to kind of direct the show in my head before I do it in the room. I start envisioning scenes and spaces and transitions and musical numbers. And I'm doing all of that while I'm still kind of inside the text with my scissors and my red pen. Uh, this might bring up the question for some of you, is there a difference between an adaptation of a Shakespeare play and just cutting it, just a cut of it? Um, if you've seen any Shakespeare at all in, on modern American stages, it's like 98% likely that some of it was cut in some way, that, uh, that two hours traffic of our stage thing from Romeo and Juliet is, is just a bald-faced lie. Um, <laughs> unless they spoke like the absolute blazes. Um, there's no way most of these plays are coming off in two hours alone with an uncut text. So that means you've probably seen a somewhat cut version um, when you see these things. Um, but does that mean that you've seen an adaptation? I mean, as I was arguing earlier, I would say sort of just based on my definitions, yes. But I do think that there are plenty of cuts of Shakespeare out there that have happened without the sort of specificity of purpose that I'm talking about that really makes for an exciting production slash adaptation on stage. Uh, you can cut a play just to make it shorter, basically by taking out all of the repetitions and all of the jokes that you don't get. Um, but you can also cut and rearrange and refashion sort of based on your understanding of that central question that I was talking about earlier. You can guide your cutting along the lines of a certain theme or struggle that you're trying to highlight. What I'm really kind of getting to is that something's got to be driving the choices that you as a director make when you're working on your adaptation. Um, and I think of it this way, right? Like, what story do I want to tell? Because every one of these plays has a wealth of stories inside them. Is Hamlet a family play or a socio-political play or an existential play or a metatheatrical play or a war play or a ghost story? Well, really it's all of them. And in different times, certain of those threads might seem more powerful for us to kind of pluck at, right? More worth reinvestigating. In adapting a play, a director decides either explicitly or implicitly, you know, either by thinking about it or not by thinking about it, but it happens anyway, which threads in this kind of dense braided through line she wants to bring to the fore. As an example, uh, the director, Sam Gold, did a production of Hamlet a couple of years ago in New York with Oscar Isaac in the title role. It was incredibly spare. Um, they almost looked like they were in kind of street clothes or even sort of pajamas sometimes. Um, very, very empty. When objects were used, they were modern objects. Uh, very dark, very sort of, um, by which I mean literally, just sort of like shadows in the lighting. Um, it was, it was really stripped away, right? And I think for Sam Gold, uh, and there was something almost sort of casual in the delivery of the language. Um, and I think for Sam Gold, Hamlet was a story about a father and a son and sort of fathers and children. Um, and it was a story about death and grief. And it was a story about theater, about the kind of like simple in the moment act of, of acting. Um, compare that, right, to say, Kenneth Branagh's film of Hamlet, which is just, you know, gilded and kind of stuffed to the seams with period detail and cinematic flourishes and famous actors and big close-ups and big zooms out. Um, it's the kind of everything and the kitchen sink Hamlet. And so I think, you know, for, for Branagh, there's something much more, he's much more invested in the kind of sumptuousness and the royalty and the scale of Hamlet's story, right? Like, this isn't just a, a boy who's lost his father, he's also a prince. Um, there's something interesting, right, about Hamlet's, you know, in, in a director's decision about whether or not to include Fortinbras at the end, right? Like, so in Hamlet, there's a character from a neighboring warring country who comes in and kind of, you know, claims the fallen apart Denmark at the end, Fortinbras, the Prince of Norway, comes in and says, well, it's all mine now. Um, but he also says some good things about Hamlet, right? He says, oh, you know, if he had become king, he would have proved most, most royal. And he kind of lets his body be taken away in state. 
Some productions cut Fortinbras entirely. Sam Gold cut Fortinbras. Kenneth Branagh did not and made a big deal out of the interest, uh, entrance of this new actor and the kind of instatement of Hamlet dead as this, you know, not just a dead boy, but a dead monarch. So for Kenneth Branagh, it becomes kind of, you know, a story of the tragedy of an entire nation. Frankly, it also becomes this uh, story about Kenneth Branagh. Um, <laughs> but so to oversimplify it, like if you're looking at these two productions from the outside, you can start at least by thinking of, of it as a matter of tone and texture, right? Like if you were gonna describe these productions, how would you describe their worlds? And as a director from the inside, how would you describe the kind of world that you want to build for the audience, right? Like real, just very simply in terms of adjectives, you know, kind of lighter or darker, cynical or hopeful, fantastical or gritty and real, strange or familiar. All of those aesthetic and tonal questions ultimately lead back to, or should lead back to, that idea of your scream, right? Of the director's scream, the understanding of that central question, that kind of super task that you've located at the heart of the play. Um, here, I'm gonna dive really quickly again into one more uh, Russian thing before we, we're in, we're in our sort of like last lap and a half. So uh, uh, thank you all. And I'm super excited to get your questions. Um, uh, I'm going to dive right back into the Russians for a second because this is something that I really find juicy when working on Shakespeare um, and really, you know, uh, plays in general, but I think it, it works very well for Shakespeare. Um, there's another Russian I'm going to bring up now named Georgi Tostanogov, who's, uh, what a guy. Um, he's, <laughs> he's part of the lineage of directors that goes back to Stanislavski, um, and he was kind of active in the mid-century in the kind of Khrushchev and Brezhnev eras. Uh, and he came up with a way of breaking down a play that I think about constantly when I work on Shakespeare. And I'm actually gonna put it up on the screen for all of y'all now. So just give me a second here. Do, do, do. Cool, so what we are gonna look at together is um, Tostanogov's five event structure. And I think I am sharing it now. Yes, I hope so. Um, Excellent. Yell at me if uh, if you're not seeing a Google Doc. <laughs> uh, so, Tostanogov came up with this idea that you can break any play down into five events, and I'm showing them to you on the screen. Uh, there, the names of them. There's a little bit of debate because they come out of Russian translation. But let's start at the beginning. We've got the opening event, the conflicting event, the climactic event, the concluding event and the closing event. Weird to have concluding and closing, but you'll kind of, I think it'll come clear in a second. So the opening event establishes the world of the play, the circumstance in which the primary burning question of the play presents itself. Often that event is already in motion before the play begins. It's, it might be suggested uh, by the playwright or alluded to, but the key thing about it is that the director has to decide how to convey it to the audience. Then we've got the conflicting event. And the reason it's, it's called the conflicting event is because this is the first time that something kind of presents a collision with that world of given circumstances established in the opening event. Really, this is where the action of the play sort of takes off, right? And the struggle begins. Um, it's usually a pretty sudden thing and it does not always immediately follow the opening event. I'm gonna give an example of all of this in a second. Uh, then we have the climactic event, and this is where the struggle sort of reaches its peak, like the circumstance of the beginning of the play and the uh, and and whatever is conflicting with it really kind of reach ahead, and action is altered from there on out. It has a huge effect on the course of people can go no further. It's exhausted somehow. Um, it could end happily or unhappily, but uh, but that's but you know this is this is where the play. Oh, hang on, I'm looking at the chat. Let's see. Oh, okay. Um, good. I'll, I will get to that at the end. Okay. Uh, but this is where the play kind of, um, we're getting to the end of, of the playwright's world, right? But what's interesting is that concluding is different from closing. And closing, again, is where the director really comes to the fore. Because closing has to do with production, not with play. The closing event is the last thing that you as the audience see. It's the literal final image. It's the choice that's made kind of visually, tonally, all those things in the room uh, to leave you with. So the thing that's so, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a second and come back, hello. Um, 
So the thing that I think is so galvanizing and, and interesting for me about the way Tovstinogov breaks down a play um, is that it, it puts these, the, the sort of frame really explicitly in the director's hands, right? It says your responsibility is to, is to, is to convey, is to share with the audience in a, in a um, you know, in an explosive kind of like uh, soul shaking way, like what the circumstances at the top of this play and then what the, what the end of its arc is. Um, the example that I'll use is Romeo and Juliet, right? So let's talk through this really quick. You might identify, I, I, I will do this for the sake of this argument, the, the kind of burning question of Romeo and Juliet. Um, it's super task, if you will. You might identify that burning question as, can love alter a world built on hate? Can it? So if you did that, perhaps your opening event, well, your opening event would have to somehow ha do with the feud between the Capulets and the Montagues, right? Your opening event would somehow have to convey, and Shakespeare does this for you. The first scene of the play is a fight and you can keep his text or you can modify his text or you can throw his text out, but he's giving you a fight. So how do you convey at the top of the play, visually, tonally, the whole thing, that world built on hate? How do you show the feud? How do you show the given circumstances of the world as a director? Then we get to the conflicting event, number two, right? That's Romeo and Juliet's meeting. So for the first time, love enters the world built on hate. Climactic event, number three, Romeo kills Tybalt. So everything changes, right? The lover, the person, one of the people who brought love into this world has now become a murderer hate and conflict reassert themselves. Everything has to change. The whole plot has to turn a corner. Romeo has to flee. Juliet and the friar hatch their plan. Tragedy is coming. Concluding event, number four, would really sort of bring the textual story to a close. It would be the death of the lovers. There is no more struggle. There is no more fight because the lovers are dead. However, what about closing event? How do you leave the audience as a director with the story of this play? In, there is an implied reconciliation between the two feuding families, right? Between Capulet and Montague. But a director can interpret this, can like, and it has to do with the answer to that question, or at least the kind of, if not a, if not a hard answer, then our suspicions about it, right? That initial question, can love alter a world built on hate? Well, a director could show you a sad but resolved and even potentially kind of hopeful ending. She could show you a world in which Capulet and Montague are beginning to heal together. And that's headed towards yes, right? Like, yes, love has, there's hope for love to make this great change. Or perhaps a director could show you the suspicion that really nothing has changed and that in the final moments of the play, what are the families doing? Well, they're saying that they're gonna heal, but they're also sort of saying, well, I'm gonna build a statue of your kid. Well, my statue of your kid is gonna be bigger and brighter gold. Like a director could sort of see the fact that there's implied competition uh, filtering back in even amidst the healing. And a director could say, well, I'm gonna underline that, you know, and I'm, I'm suspicious that, that love was sacrificed for nothing and that the cycle is going to continue. So that's really, like, that's the power for me of, of kind of, you know, of, of breaking down a play, not just in terms of what the playwright is given, but also in terms of a director's ability to interact with that. Um, I think when I first discovered Tovstinogov's five event structure, I was super excited because it actually gave form to a way that I had already been thinking about directing Shakespeare for a long time. Uh, when I was younger and realizing that I wanted to direct, I used to make a mental note for myself every time I had a vision in my head of how I thought a play should either begin or end. Uh, I used to get these in the shower a lot, right? Those sort of like shower revelations that we all had. Um, and often I would see it very clearly. And I still, I still do this sometimes. I'll sort of get a sequence of music or movement in my head and I'll think, you know, that's the way this play starts. Um, and I think that what was happening before I sort of had a form for it, which, you know, I think Tovstinogov gives a really interesting one, 
what was happening was that I was beginning to formulate my that opening event right like my interpretation of the world of this play and how I wanted to kind of introduce that to audiences um, I'm going to give a couple examples of this from my shows at Two River and then we're going to be done with my part because I know this is a lot and we'll we'll get into questions so here uh, to end with are and I'm going to try again to uh, to share my screen while I do this so I can kind of show you some images from these productions while I talk about them we're not doing video because I just am allergic to video of theater productions. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to do images instead. But, um, but let me just get my screen to a place of sharing again. We're going to start with the Twelfth Night. Um, so we'll, we'll look at a little example from each of the productions that I've done at Two River and I'll sort of talk a little bit only about the opening event, just as a kind of example of a director's, uh, a director's approach and interpretation for each of these pieces. So here we go. Um, going to going to share my screen again. Share screen. Share. Excellent. All right, and we should have some Google pictures. Okay. So. Hopefully uh, you are now looking at a wonderful picture of Tommy Crawford who played Fetty the Fool um, in my production of Twelfth Night at Two River. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the openings to these shows. So Twelfth Night, this production began with a, a kind of empty stage, a little toy um, model boat in the middle of it, sort of emptiness, light, space, and then a lone figure, the fool that you see here, Feste, walked in and kind of quietly started creating noises on his guitar that built into, oh, uh, here, yes, here, here's the stage, that built into a kind of Foley soundscape created storm that the whole ensemble was a part of. Uh, music came in and it wasn't just noise, there was a huge sort of almost uh, overture-like piece of music that introduced us to our central characters, the twins, Viola and Sebastian, and that created a kind of theatrical tempest as they got, as we kind of witnessed the storm that tore them apart. And that is the, the pre-event that lands us in the country of Illyria where the play takes place. Uh, this storm took the entire ensemble to create. It was made of very simple elements like ropes and plastic and this little prop and musical instruments. Um, and then at the end, it, it landed us in the world of the Duke Orsino, who actually is, is the literal beginning of Shakespeare's play, of the text of Shakespeare's play. The music from the storm calmed down and it became the music of Orsino's court and landed us in a place where, the, where Orsino could say, if music be the food of love, play on. Cool, so that's one. Let's go to another very different play. Uh, this is Macbeth that was done with the Little Shakespeare program. So in Macbeth, we started with a weird, dark, kind of abandoned playground almost, like a very creepy space, a space with an old swing set and a rusty stoplight hanging in midair, a weird old dirty wall. Uh, a single, a little girl entered with a red ball. Uh, and I'm just I'm gonna check my chat really quick and make sure. Oh yeah, represent Grace, yes! Okay, good. Um, I lost my screen. Okay, here we go. Um, a little girl entered with a red ball and uh, was quickly followed with, by some very eerie sounds and then another child who brought in a very creepy doll. <laughs> and then, um, there we go. And then the, the two children started playing catch together with the ball as these sort of strange nightmarish sounds built around them. Um, you know, they were playing, but there was no smiles. There was no sort of sense that this game um, would end well. <laughs> um, a third child entered, clear the, clearly the leader. And we learned as Shakespeare's text started to merge in the scene that these were our witches. The witches took their places on the swing set and they stayed there kind of swinging in a haunting fashion all the way through a long, intense, violent, chaotic battle sequence uh, that introduced us to the human world of the play and to the conflict raging in Scotland. Um, they even were a part of this sequence 
in the fact that one of the characters, the bloody sergeant, who we know has um, had sort of terrible wounds from the battle, uh, he witnessed them and we kind of established a uh, metaphorical vocabulary for blood and death where in the course of the battle's chaos, he walked away with the witches and we sort of understood that to mean he is, he's, he's toast. Uh, but we maintained the presence of the witches throughout this, uh, throughout this opening sequence. So that's Macbeth. Um, going to do one more and then we're clear. So comedy of errors, welcome to comedy of errors. Uh, the thing about comedy of errors that was kind of special and interesting is that I decided to create a frame for the entire show. Uh, what you're seeing right here is one of the very first images of the show. And this is an actor on stage doing the prologue to Romeo and Juliet. So the idea for the comedy of errors that we did at Two River was that actually this company of actors that we've come to see is attempting to do a production of Romeo and Juliet. And yet in the first couple of moments, there's a bunch of kerfuffle backstage. Um, actors start to sort of lose it, chaos breaks out, and it turns out that this quote unquote production of Romeo and Juliet has lost its star actor and won't be able to continue. In the next uh, sequence of moments, what happens is that uh, the actors kind of band, the, these, you know, these, these actors of the troupe band together and decide that they're gonna save the day by presenting instead the comedy of errors from their rep. So there's a bunch of kind of running around and chaos and getting things together and switching costumes and taking on new props and using a set that wasn't supposed to be used for this play for the, you know, for a new play uh, and telling the story, uh, the background story of Comedy of Errors so that it can land us in the opening scene um, and, get, and get started. So uh, coming out of sharing my screen with y'all again, so this is the thing, right? I'll try to, I'll say very quickly, like what, uh, what each of these opening events was meant to communicate. Um, and we'll, perhaps we'll see. So, so the question, right, is with, with, with each of these sort of opening events that I've described, these establishments of world by a director and her company, um, what, what did each one tell the audience? Uh, well, I can at least tell you what the intention was behind each. And with Twelfth Night, the intention was very much to try to establish a kind of porous, shifting, intentionally, intentionally theatrical world where the performance of the actors, the fact that they exist as actors there with us, was acknowledged openly up front, um, where we knew these people could look us in the eye and we knew that in a, in a moment they could go from playing instruments to enacting a storm, to dropping into a character, a role. Um, I think what this was meant to communicate for me was that identity isn't solid in this world. It's always going to be shifting. It's going to be a world of waves and storms and un uncertainty, sort of uncertain ground, um, a coastal world, a world of winds and rains, um, and also a world of longing and loss, uh, even amidst the humor. Uh, so the question I think, you know, that I was sort of really trying to keep in my mind all throughout Twelfth Night was in a kind of world of disguises and delusion and debauchery, uh, how possible is it to ever really know someone, whether that's a friend, a lover, ourselves? For Macbeth, uh, <laughs> so Macbeth for me is first and foremost a psychological play. Um, and like Hamlet, right, it's mini plays, it's a political play, it's a historical play, it's a war play. But I'm particularly interested and also was interested in this specific 90 minute production um, in the psychological play that I think is the heart of it, in drawing out a story that's about a soul, actually about a pair of souls who destroy themselves and who kind of destroy their world too. Um, I wanted the whole thing to feel like a nightmare, to have this haunting fever dreamish aspect to it, to be full of kind of strange images that have that deja vu-ish feeling to them. The children, the playground, the soundscape, the flashing lights, um, the way we staged the battles, which were weaponless. They were just sort of chaos and bodies in space and strange red strings coming out of bodies kind of representing your life threads somehow. 
Um, all of that was supposed to create a space and a world that didn't feel historically factual, but instead felt psychologically real and frightening. Um, it's actually very hard for me to formulate a, a clean question for Macbeth, um, one that doesn't feel too easy, too answerable, because I think it's a really terrifying play. Um, but I know that for me, the play is about violence and about the human soul and about the kind of terrifying power of our own minds to manifest and to tear ourselves and the world apart. To end on a happier note, um, <laughs> Comedy of Errors. I love Comedy of Errors. It's one of my biggest guilty pleasure plays. And I will be the first to admit that it is very, very silly. Um, and I'm not in entirely you know, inclined to sort of apply a toast to no govian uh, structure to it and to say, you know, well, this is the deep and burning question of Comedy of Errors. Um, it's mostly a really delightful farce. But I do think that if I were to identify something deeper in the play, I think that it's got a kind of bright, forgiving communal spirit to it. Um, it's a kind of clown world where hope really kind of bubbles up all the time. Like even if people are cheated on or beaten or locked in their own basements by weird mad scientists, like everything turns out all right in the end. And everyone forgives and everyone laughs and everyone kind of, and, and even authorities sort of um, acts for the good. Uh, and then there are the two Dromeos, the servant figures in the play who close the play with this really beautiful line, um, at, which is interesting because usually the highest status person on stage closes a Shakespeare play, but the two Dromeos get to close the play by saying, um, we came into the world like brother and brother and now let's go hand in hand, the one before the other. So I think for me, you know, there was something about this framing vision of a theater company facing disaster that allowed for Comedy of Errors to be both a literal comedy of errors, haha, um, but also allowed for the entire story to be a kind of massive adrenaline and love fueled communal effort. This big group of people sort of trying so hard to do something where in any moment it could go terribly wrong. And every moment is an effort by these actors to hold each other up and to go hand in hand with each other. So that, that for me is the way in which that vision came out of something I felt like I had located in the play. Um, this is really it. This is it for me. I'm sorry that I, uh, that I have, have um, <laughs> filled so much time without um, your questions, but I would really, really love to get your questions. And, and I will say, I know a couple of people that have had to jet. Totally fine. If you have to go do your thing, great. But I'm here um, and I would love to engage with questions for as long as people have them. Oh, one thing I'll do really fast before that is just to put, a, I'm gonna share my screen again for one more second. Um, and it's gonna show you a kind of list of takeaways from this that are kind of my big, uh, like some of my big points. Um, and this, this stuff, uh, once it goes away, once I stop sharing my screen, you can get this later. Two River is going to put some of these documents and stuff that I've showed you on their website. So if you're interested in, in reading these again or having them, they'll be available. Um, let me share my screen just one more time as I pull up this. Okay, so hang on a second. Where are you, Zoom? Okay, share. Boom. Boom. Great. So these are what I would say are my major takeaways, right? In terms of adapting and directing Shakespeare, the kind of uh, perhaps not so brief, but you know, well-meaning and dirty Sarah Holdren approach. Um, one, identify the big question, the playwright's suffering. The thing is really about for you and for you is an important part of that. Two, have something to say about that question. Have something to scream about. Have a reason that this play needs to happen again. Three, let your understanding of this question and your response to it drive the cut or the rearrangement or the riff or the interpretation that you are doing. Hold on to that through line of action laid out by your sense of that central question. We didn't really get into Shakespeare's language much in this class, but, but language is also a huge part of this in a Shakespeare play because the richness and the metaphor and the images of the language, I think, are also a place where you're going to start sensing that, that thing, that thing at the heart, like what is it really about? There's so much language about thought and the brain and the, and the kind of like um, the, the scary place that is the mind in Macbeth. And I think that's one of the reasons that, you know, that that to me became the whole world. Four, 
in working with your designers and your actors. And yes, another asterisk. I know we didn't really talk about this at all in this class. We need another one. There'll be another one. I don't know. No, not necessarily, but it would take a whole other workshop to talk about design in Shakespeare. So putting uh, the bulk of it aside, but to say four, in working with your designers and your actors, be clear about your understanding of the play. It takes communication of vision. It takes communication of what the play is really about for you and consequently how the world should feel and look and smell and sound. Um, it takes practice talking about this in a way that's not literal and, um, and prescriptive and demanding, but is rather imaginative and collaborative and suggestive. Um, your collaborators come, become co-stewards of the world with you this way. They also make discoveries based on this communication of a deep central theme. And last of all, think about beginnings and endings. Those amazing Tovstonogov opening and closing events, they're a huge part of what make a director's interpretation or mark in Shakespeare. You introduce the world, you build the world, and then you figure out the final image that, you, that it leaves behind. Um, so those are really, that's, that's my kind of big list of like the top five takeaways. Um, I'm revealing my Shakespeare shirt here at the very end. So, uh, oh, I was asked to zoom in on the text. Well, you can go look for it on the website afterwards, but <laughs> so I'm done talking now. Well, you know, probably not, but at least in my, uh, at least in the, in the opening sense. And, um, let's do some questions. Uh, who, let's see. Um, Amazing moderators. Do you want to point me towards a question or should I go through the chat? What do you think? Sure. Um, I can read them off to you if that's easier. I'll start off uh, with Stephen. Can you hear me? Let's do that. Okay, great. Um, a question from Stephen says, how much does each actor's interpretation of their character and the play impact your vision or of a adaptation for their work? Uh, is this in the chat somewhere? I think it is. I just yes. want to read it to myself how okay how much does each actor's interpretation of their character and the play impact your vision with aha okay i see awesome a lot i think i mean um i think that one of the things about directing in general and then you know in this specific case on shakespeare especially because these characters are so rich um, and wonderful is that like another thing i feel about directing is that part of your job is to be as like massively, massively prepared as possible, but not so that you can have made all your decisions beforehand, like rather so that you can have a wealth of response to your collaborators. So an actor comes in the room and has an idea that you've never thought of for a particular character say, and it's fascinating. The point would definitely not be to refer to your giant sheath of notes and say, ah, like, you know, that doesn't, you know, like that doesn't fit in with my pre-existing, uh, you know, kind of like the way that I've imagined the world of this play. Um, the idea would be to like, to take that in and say, oh, well, this is fascinating. I've never thought of it. What do I, because I have done all of this thinking and all of this preparation, like, what do I have? to respond to that with and how can there be, kind of become like an alchemy of the two things, right? Like I actually, I, I really like to think about collaboration um, which can be like sort of such an overused buzzword and I think can become really, really softly interpreted, right? You know, like we can think of collaboration as just like a room in which everyone is always very happy and no toes are ever stepped on. But I actually, I, I like to think about collaboration whether it's with designers or with actors as you're talking about, um, as a kind of meeting of strong propositions, right? Like I bring a strong proposition, an actor brings a strong proposition. Are they necessarily in sync right away? Maybe not, but like some kind of really interesting alchemy can come out of that. So yes, I think, you know, even, even in all of this sort of pre-thought, there needs to be a, a deep kind of um, elastic space for the other um, minds and bodies in the room. Does that answer that? No one can say yes, but. <laughs> Great. You want to just keep going down these? Let's. Okay, All so right. let's. See. From Emma, yeah. do you take anything more into consideration when you're adapting for accessibility? Example, with a little Shakespeare for audiences of younger students, as opposed to an adaptation that would be mainly for an adult, an audience of adults. 
Great question. Um, so I have to admit that uh, in, in my experience thus far, the answer has been no, um, at least in terms of age level. I mean, I think there are a lot of different ways to think of um, accessibility, but at least in terms of age, uh, I haven't really, like, especially with those little Shakespeare productions and, and most especially with Macbeth, um, I mean, I haven't really done anything that I would say, I, I actually really, um, I guess once, <laughs> I here, I mean, I'm trying to be like like a little bit uh, delicate about this because like of course I think that like you can you know as tiny kids as elementary schoolers do some sort of like stripped down awesome more age appropriate version of Shakespeare that's like super wonderful. I think once you get to high school and even to middle school though like I think we can give that age like I I just like I just give that age of audience and actor a whole lot of credit like I actually think that they are all already. Um, so ready and so uh, sophisticated and so like curious um, and and you know are are coping with thoughts and ideas and news and input from the world that are already like quite a lot and quite you know so if it's something I mean I remember I remember talking to uh, John Diaz Two Rivers you know wonderful wonderful artistic director about our production of Macbeth before we headed into it when we were still deciding, is this the play that we want to stage for a little Shakespeare? And I remember sort of saying to him, I mean, if you, if you want me to do this project and if we do Macbeth, we're going to do Macbeth. <laughs> um, we're not going to do like Kitty Macbeth. We're going to do Apocalypse Now, Heart of Darkness, terrifying journey to the center of the, like, of the destroyed soul Macbeth. And he was like, yeah, do Macbeth. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I think that for me, um, I'm really interested in, in kind of, um, I mean, I'm not interested in shock for the sake of shock um, or in, you know, or, but I do think that, um, that Shakespeare's plays are actually just so, I think that people are ready for them before we think they are. And that like, you know, if, you, if, if the storytelling, whether it's about disturbing things or happy things, um, if it puts out a hand to you and if it leads you along and it says like, come along with us, you will be taken care of as an audience member. Um, then like, I don't necessarily think there's a lot uh, of alteration that I feel is necessary. Is this the next one? Yes. From Linda, beyond novelty, what might drive a director to switch gender, i.e. a female pro sparrow? What a cool question. Um, so many things, I think, right? And, and I think it's super personal to the director too. Um, so it's interesting that you bring up a, a female Prospero, right? Because um, I think that's actually, um, so, so for anybody out there, um, uh, I've been trying to catch myself. I'm sorry if I've been sometimes throwing out references without explaining them, but, um, but just to clarify this one, Prospero is from The Tempest. Um, one of Shakespeare's really, really late plays um, and is an enchanter uh, on this magical island with his daughter, Miranda. Um, and the play kind of circles around his um, uh, quest for revenge that then becomes a, a, de a decision to forgive. Um, and I think it's a character that these days has been really commonly gender switched. We've, there's been a lot of, um, of women playing Prospero as, as a woman, as Prospera even, or as just, you know, as a, um, as a mother figure instead of as a father figure. Um, I think, I mean, I think there are so many reasons why directors and also theaters, you know, get interested in this. I mean, the canon is so incredibly rich and yet like there's no point in arguing that its richness is equal uh, for women. It's not. Um, there are amazing, amazing roles for women, um, but you know, but but there are Hamlets and there are Richard the Thirds and there are Prosperos um, and these were not originally written uh, written for women and I think that there's just you know, I mean, I think that there's a there's a desire to explore female power, female leadership, and also like in terms of like you know when you get to something like a Richard or even like a Prospero, you know like female complexity and, and like wickedness too, you know, like the fact that 
this, you know, like in a gender switch, you kind of get to explore like facets that maybe a, a woman character doesn't actually get to um, get to portray or represent that much in these plays. Um, it's interesting though, I mean, I, like personally, I always, I, I like as as much as I really believe in like doing all sorts of th things with these plays, like I, I believe in the right of people to rip them apart because I actually, because I don't believe they're destroyable. So, you know, do what you want and see what happens. The thing will always, you know, you haven't, you haven't destroyed the thing in any way. You haven't hurt the thing. Um, even though I believe in that, I do personally find myself really um, often just thinking long and hard about what it means to switch the gender of a character. I switch the gender of actors all the time. And I actually like have no issue with that. I did a Merchant of Venice where a woman played Shylock as a man, but I was really excited about having a woman and a woman's mind and a woman's body in that role. Um, the reason for that was partly out of necessity. It was the ensemble I was working with, but also like one, as a soul, she was right for the part. And two, I think there's a way in like in that particular context, there's a way in which Shylock as the Jewish character in that play, uh, which like is such an outsider and so mistreated and so set apart from the rest of the world of the play. I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think that like in that play, you know, I think we don't necessarily have a picture of really what it meant to be Jewish in the context in which that play was written and the extent to which a Jewish person is such a complete social outsider. Um, we're, it, kind of terrifyingly, maybe we're getting like a little bit more of a hint of that now in certain ways, like a, a re, resurged hint of that. But there was a way in which having a body that was visibly different, that, that was sort of other in a way, worked in that role for me that said, you know, like, you might not interpret this person as that different, but believe me, the characters on stage know that they are different and they act cruelly based upon that difference. Um, so that might be a little bit of a heady reason why a female Shylock worked for me, but again, I didn't actually switch the gender of the role because I'm sort of more interested in souls I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in souls than roles, ultimately. I had a female Macbeth. I had, um, uh, I had a female Duncan when we did it. But again, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't ask them to play Macbeth and Duncan as women. Um, I'm kind of more interested in like the malleability of the actor and like what a woman can put into a, a, a male role without kind of like doing the gymnastics of saying, well, we've switched the gender of the role and now we have to reinterpret the entire sociopolitical world in which the role exists. Does that make sense? That's like, a, it's a lot. There's, that's a super great deep question. I, I feel like I should move on to the next one, but I, I have a lot of, um, it's an exciting question to think about. All right, Sarah, this is Hannah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, so we have our next question from Jacob. It says, you talked about cutting characters or events in certain plays. What say you to an adaptation where the events or characters are flipped, i.e. Hamlet doesn't die at the end? So I guess kind of maybe what's the line between adaptation and outright plot changes? <laughs> can somebody, Jacob, can you tell me where this version is where Hamlet doesn't die at the end? Like what? Excuse me, I'm sorry, why? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's, it's so funny because that's such an insane example that I don't quite know how to respond. No, I mean, like, <laughs> Hamlet has to die. That's not, it's, you know, like, that's, that's not a thing. No, <laughs> this is where all of my openness comes to an end. Hamlet must die. Um, no. Um, I mean, like, I feel like... I feel like there is, you know, so I've, I've spent most of my time today talking about, um, talking about sort of a director's approach to Shakespeare and, and a certain kind of adaptation that um, at least in, at least in terms of the productions that I, that we focused on at the end, Twelfth Night and Macbeth and Comedy of Errors, that in certain ways hues closer to the original text um, even though there are certain uh, 
you know, I mean, I cut whole scenes in Macbeth. I rearranged things. Comedy of Errors got a whole frame. Like, even though there are certain intense gestures happening, um, I would argue that the kind of essence of the play is intact inside of that. Um, there's definitely stuff out there that's kind of more explosive, I think. Um, and I think, and, you know, I sort of, like, so for instance, I didn't spend a lot of time today talking about a production that I worked on called Midsummer which is a more radically rearranged kind of riff on A Midsummer Night's Dream. It uses a lot of the characters, it uses the plot lines, but it really reimagines the world and it has a whole different kind of super task, if you will. Like it, it, um, it creates a new story and it uses new text as well. So that's just its own show. And I frankly really liked that show and I was really proud of that show. It's not A Midsummer Night's Dream, it's Midsummer. Um, and you know, if there's something out there where it's kind of like Hamlet, but like somehow Hamlet doesn't die. I mean, I, I you know, like I, I would just say it's its own thing probably. You know, like at that point, I just wanna, I just wanna see the thing. Cause I have to kind of, you know, there's, I have no desire to like dismiss or, or approve out of hand, right? It's kind of like, well, is it a good show? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, um, and that's kind of what I'm interested in, you know, like if, if somebody has managed to create like a really thoughtful, affecting, powerful theater event, um, then I don't need it to be, you know, Hamlet 101. It, uh, it can be Hamlet's explosion. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess that's, you know, then we're sort of moving into the world of like, of the riff, you know, or of the sort of devised piece, maybe, um, the sort of theater uh, response. With its own real, with its own rules and its own um, and its own super task, which may or may not actually, you know, which is probably a response to say the super task of Hamlet, but isn't necessarily the same. Does that make sense? <laughs> I should stop asking if that makes sense. No one's, no one can respond. <laughs> you are all good. <laughs> so, um, next question <laughs> is from Carol. Um, was the beautiful rain at the end of Twelfth Night in response to the difficulty of knowing who anyone is or who, who you are? Or what was the motivation behind that choice? Yeah, I mean, simply, that's, thank you so much, um, Carol. And, and yes, uh, I mean, I think, see, the thing about Twelfth Night is that, I mean, I, I, I believe that the, that the heart of that play is is just right there and present and beating in that final song, um, which is such an amazing gift from Shakespeare. Like when I was going over those events earlier, right? Um, usually the closing event, that thing that comes after the conclusion isn't textual. Usually it's like the way in which the director chooses to show an ending somehow. But Twelfth Night is kind of amazingly unique because Shakespeare actually has given you the closing event. There's this, you know, like, here's this amazing song, which isn't really a part of the scene. There's no implication that Feste sort of walks in and says, okay, now I'll sing a song now. You know, it's just the theatrical world and the author reasserting itself and saying, and here's a thought to end with, you know, no matter how much fun you've had or not had, here's a thought. Um, and I think it's the heart of the play, that incredible song, um, the, the rain, it raineth every day. Um, and I knew from the beginning, especially working with the amazing band, The Lobbyists, which did the music for that production, um, that I wanted that song to, to kind of let the actors step softly out of character, um, not, not fully abandon it, but kind of, come face to face with it a little bit, like sort of step back as it were. Like if, you know, if I'm here and I've got my Viola mask on, I just sort of step softly a foot back and say, okay, well, here's Viola and here's me and there's you and you are Asino and you're also Joey and there's the audience and there's Tommy, you know, and, and to have a kind of moment of, um, of sort of like, I mean, melancholy is, a, is, a, is, you know, a word that comes up a lot with Twelfth Night, right? But I think it's a sort of beautiful word because it doesn't mean, doesn't mean like deadly sorrow and it doesn't mean despair. It just means that like our, our revels are sort of tinged with something um, and they're tinged with, yeah, with an unknowing and an uncertainty and a question and a kind of knowledge that the rain, it raineth every day. Um, and, and yes, and, and I think to answer your question, yeah, like, that feeling, that visceral feeling in us that like, 
knowing might not be possible. Um, and we go on and we love and we try, but like, you know, certainty is maybe out of reach. Um, maybe it's like right, you know, sort of right behind the rain cloud, sort of. Yeah. Beautiful. All right. The next question is from Jamie. Do you feel that a certain concept can only work with a certain cast or specific actors? Mm -hmm, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that there are times in which that could definitely be the case. Um, I mean, I think that there are there are sort of concepts and there are concepts, right? Like, um, you know, I talked earlier about the way in which that word can kind of get, uh, you know, it can it can develop a sort of sense of like or like a big capital C, you know. Um, uh, and and but but whether or not uh, whether or not you know we're sort of into the the concept that we're being presented with, um, I think you know there there are, there are ones that have just sort of you know more requirements or more rules maybe than others. Um, there was a um, a much ado about nothing that actually I think that I think you can even maybe watch it right now. It was it was done at, at the public theater at Shakespeare in the Park um, a couple summers ago. And it had an entirely black cast, and it was very much set in a kind of like um, it, it, it was set in Georgia, but in a sort of imagined near future where there was a sort of um, where there was national conflict going on based on a lot of the like political upheaval that's in the air right now. And the play really uh, the Don Don um, Pedro. Don Pedro's soldiers were almost a kind of like resistance army. Um, and then the, the, the whole, you know, like the family drama of it all occurred within this one household. Um, and I think, you know, with, a, with an idea like that, with, that was Kenny Leon's production, like, yes, like they needed a cast of African-American actors and they needed, like, and, they, and they specifically wanted to craft a story that had a, a specific kind of connection to things that were going on right now. Um, or I can think of like, uh, you know, maybe there, maybe again, you know, like just speaking of like a, to sort of cast specifics, right? It's like I can envision all female or all male productions that like maybe make that choice for a really specific reason. Um, I have a adaptation -y thing of Henry V in my head that I haven't done yet, but a couple of friends and I have been talking about it. And the idea is to do it with five women um, and to sort of take this uh you know this this really kind of like vexed nationalistic masculine um play and kind of see what happens um when it's like dug around in by five women specifically um so yeah i mean i think that that can be a real thing um i don't think that's always the case i mean with something like the the sort of questions and worlds that again i was talking about with uh with say my the 12th night or the macbeth or the um uh, comedy of errors. I mean, I don't think that those necessarily had a kind of um, ensemble need in that way, a need for the ensemble to be a specific thing, but some, some can, I think. All right, uh, we have a question from Claire. Do you have any recommendations for jobs or ways to start producing your plays at theaters? Oh golly, hi Claire. Um, <laughs> uh, well, well, I have no recommendations for jobs right now because the world is crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm sorry, that's that's too facetious. But um, but I would. I mean, I like hopefully, fingers crossed that like you know that we'll be able to gather and make work again very soon. And. Um, and I mean, what I would say is, what would I say? I would say find collaborators that you love. Um, keep track of projects in your own head that you really want to work on, whether that's a, a play, you know, like I want to do this play or whether it's an idea, whether it's like, you know, I, um, I'm really interested in, you know, like riffing off of this piece, but I want to make something new out of it. Like keep track of those projects and keep track of the people that you want to make them with and um and then 
I mean, there's like, there's so many, so many, so many different paths and none of them is the right one. And no matter which one you find yourself on, you're sometimes going to feel like it's leading in utterly the wrong direction. And that, and it's not, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just tricky. Like, I really do think that in order to maintain like any sense of this crazy field being worthwhile, you have, you just have, you sort of have to search for your people. You have to search for your people and for like the stories you love and you have to sort of try to find the little squidgy spaces to make your own work. Like whether it's like, I have a, you know, this basement for a couple of nights and like, I want people to come do a thing together or whether it's, you know, I'm gonna try to go to school for it. I'm gonna try to, you know, do as many productions as I can while I'm at school. Like whether it's, you know, like the, whether the channels are official or, or they're just you like making space. Um, you know, it's like, I, I really do just think it's about kind of hope and having people that have your back and want to work with you and like knowing what you're interested in and being honest about that and like s searching for the people who are also interested in that and who are like, yeah, I want to get together and like, you know, riff on this weird Shakespeare play or like create our own thing or do an all female Coriolanus or, you know, whatever. <laughs> we should have a private chat about this. I'm, I'm waxing inarticulate now, but like, um, more power to you. <laughs> all right. Our next question is from Jillian, who um, wants to know what is the biggest takeaway as a director you have learned through your experience directing Shakespeare? This kind of seems like a good note to end on too, possibly, but have at it. <laughs> uh, hmm. What is the biggest takeaway? Um, I don't know if this is the, I don't know if this is the, the, the biggest one, but it's what comes to mind, um, listening to that, to that big and lovely question. Um, and, uh, and so I'll just, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, so I'll, I'll actually start with like a, a story, a little story, I think. So during Twelfth Night at Two River, um, I was up in the back of the audience one night as, um, as I and the stage management and, and, and wonderful team usually were. Uh, and there was a young uh, woman, a high school student who was ushering uh, for the show. And at intermission, she asked me if I was the director and I said yes. And she was so enthusiastic and ebullient and she was kind of like, oh my gosh, I thought I was gonna hate this and that it was gonna be so boring. And I just love it so much. And I know that like my whole school is coming to see it and I know that none of them are looking forward to it because they're just going to think it's going to be like boring and stupid. But now I'm so excited for them to see it. Like they're going to freak out. It was, it was a, a long speech like this. Um, and frankly, you know, I would rather that than, um, you know, than like so many of, of the, you know, then so many good reviews in however many like respected <laughs> journals, you know, really. Um, that was so, it, it's that kind of moment to me is hugely significant and, um, and means, and, and, and for me sort of means something must be working. Um, because for me, I believe so strongly in these plays, in this work, um, in its potential, not just, you know, I don't, it's not that I believe in them as literature, I do, but I, but I believe in them as theater and I believe in them as incredible, you know, sort of trampolines for artists um, and as places for connection and for learning about ourselves and for practicing who we are civically and emotionally and for being with each other. And, um, and I don't think that they are, uh, like I, you know, I, I don't think that they are sort of to be, to be, sh to be labeled as problematic or to be left behind because they're part of a kind of like, you know, an older canon. Um, I think that they, uh, I think that they have life 
and potential and um, and just sort of endless depth and richness and and joy in them. And it's moments like that that I feel like I am interested in continuing to do them for. Um, it's uh, I I I a directive that I give myself, and I don't know whether it's always successful, but a, direct, a, direct, a directive that I give myself as when I'm working on Shakespeare is that I would like to try to be able to make Shakespeare productions both for the person who has never read it before, has never seen it before, maybe even is like, I don't think I'm gonna like this shit. Um, and also for the person who's read it 500 times and who thinks, well, you know, impress me. Um, and it's hard to, to sort of run that full gamut and to see, you know, can I sort of hold both of those people in my hands and make something that feels true and new, make something that feels like it welcomes both of those people and everyone in between in and like surprises them in some way with some corner of the map of this extensive, uh, beautiful play that they hadn't actually explored before or that like they thought they'd explored and now you know more map is just sort of stretching in front of us all so yeah that's um maybe that's yeah that's that's where i'll end um and uh yeah thank you for that question it's a it's a big thing to meditate on <laughs> thank you sarah that was absolutely beautifully said and um thank you so much for everything that you've touched on and um brought to light and our good thinking items going forward. Um, thank you to everybody who took time out of your Sunday to join us for this Shakespeare Sunday series. Um, please join us again throughout the month. We're going to keep the bard love going um, during this, his birth month. Um, there's so much love in the chat right now for Sarah and all the, the, the great work that you did. So um, thank you all so much again. Um, thank you guys. It's really awesome to be able to talk to you. And, and, you know, next time in the same room. <laughs> yes. yeah, definitely. Everybody, please stay, um, stay safe and stay healthy and uh, watch some cool Shakespeare and let us know what you're seeing. <laughs> all right. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Bye.